Valley University, and he's working with um, Adrian Sampson and collaborators there, and he's going to be presenting some of his work in computer vision. Thank you very much for that introduction. So uh, this work was done with uh, my collaborators uh, Phil, Serena, Adrian, uh, and the title of the talk is Eva Squared, Exploiting Temporal Redundancy in Live Computer Vision. Uh, so a lot of us have seen a lot of attention being paid uh, to for getting convolutional neural networks, CNNs, uh, into various forms of embedded devices. Uh, but of course the issue with this is that they're all battery powered, and so they have a, a very important, uh, they really need to pay attention to how much energy they use. Uh, and so. There have been a lot of works recently on creating uh, what we're calling embedded vision accelerators. Uh, basically hardware that is optimized specifically for computing CNNs for the purpose of inputting vision in mobile systems. Uh, and this includes many things including FPGAs and ASICs, uh, and indeed it's been so successful that now uh, industry is using this now. So that a lot of the companies that you're seeing here have their own accelerators. So you might think, why am I still talking about this thing if it's already basically solved by industry? And the reason is because none of this work that I show up here exploits temporal redundancy. So temporal redundancy refers to the idea uh, that when you are processing natural uh, video, say for example in an augmented reality platform or a self-driving vehicle, uh, subsequent frames uh, that go by uh, are quite similar to each other. And indeed the similarity is based on motion within the frame. But unfortunately, the systems that I have showed before uh, use the same amount of energy and time to compute uh, the result for each of these frames. Uh, so instead, our system takes a completely different approach and says, let's make sure that we can capture this motion that's in the frame to dramatically reduce the amount of energy and time to compute the frames. So uh, it was really awesome to see uh, the, 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 the Turing lecture yesterday talking all about hardware software co-design. Uh, and we are absolutely uh, in with that and very excited. So I'm going to run you through uh, this, which we consider to be uh, an element of hardware software co-design. Uh, so first, some background. Uh, so convolutional neural networks uh, have this strange property of being both highly diverse because they have uh, been applied to so many applications, including here we're seeing image classification, but also things like semantic segmentation and image captioning. Um, but uh, they also have a lot of similarity. Uh, so if we look here, we find that the early layers for all of these convolutional uh, neural networks, not just those shown here, but in general, uh, have this front end, or what we're calling a prefix, which is basically a featureizer, which consists of many pooling and convolutional layers, which create features which are then processed by what we're calling the CNN suffix. And so when people produce a new CNN, or, or publish a new CNN, generally what they mean by new is that they're changing this suffix. So there's this constant uh, difference, or sorry, consistency with a CNN prefix and a CNN suffix. So now we can think about CNNs in this context, and we can think about what that means. So they communicate with activations, just like every CNN layer does. Uh, so we take in the uh, image data, compute the prefix, compute the suffix, and get our result. And uh, it's also important to point out that this CNN prefix is the vast majority of the computation. Uh, the, the, both the time and energy uh, taken is mostly on this early uh, element. Uh, and so uh, when we look at this in the context of a frame system we're producing when we're uh, processing video, this immediately seems a little bit odd, right? Like why are we doing this? Because we see that there's motion taking place on the input, and that motion is being replicated in the intermediate activations. So we see that we can perhaps exploit something very similar to what's done in video compression. So in video compression, we may have a keyframe and a predicted frame. A keyframe, for our case, will be computed normally, perhaps, and then we will see that we have this motion that is uh, matched. And because this motion is basically the same, we can actually use our understanding of the motion of the input to produce new synthetic or predicted activations and send the rest to the CNN suffix and get our vision result. So let's talk about this in a little bit more specifics. All right, so we talked about the keyframe, right? Prefix, suffix, boom, done, normal. But then, when we're talking about a predicted frame, to remember we're going to try to create those predicted activations, what we're going to do is we're going to perform motion estimation at that pixel level to create those motion vectors. We're going to use the motion that we just analyzed to then compensate for that motion in the activations. 
And then we send that, these predicted activations, to the CNN suffix, and we get our vision result. We call this uh, algorithm activation motion compensation because we're performing that motion compensation on the activations. And uh, it might be uh, confusing to think about this because maybe motion estimation is a very complex operation, many operations, and indeed it does have a lot of complexity, but it is significantly less than, CNN, than the CNN prefix. And indeed, it doesn't even use multiplies. So this is the reason why we're able to get such significant energy and latency gains that I'll be showing later in the talk. All right, so for anyone creating an AMC variant, what kinds of things do you need to figure out to be able to make this work for your system? Well, the first thing you need to answer is, how are you gonna perform that motion estimation that we talked about? How are you gonna do motion compensation? And then which frames are gonna be keyframes? All right, so we'll start with motion estimation. For motion estimation, we have to solve a little bit of a different problem uh, than the problem that is solved by uh, video compression. And the reason is because while we are performing the estimation on the pixels, the compensation is on the activations. So we need to have to figure out some kind of relationship between these so that we can make sure that the vectors that we're producing are the ones that are meant for the activations. So uh, we can uh, form this relationship uh, through what's called receptive fields. And uh, if you're already familiar, that's great, but for those of you who aren't, I'll show how that works. So here we have a very small portion of the network, just to simplify things. Uh, we have a 3x3 three three convolution that's being fed into another 3x3 three three convolution. So we can think about the input and the outputs of each of these layers as three-dimensional tensors. So we have width and a height. We also have uh, CE for channel dimension. So RGB for our input, and then we have a convolutional layer with 64 and then 64. So if we want to figure out which pixels correspond to a specific activation, we can trace it back. So say we care about this specific pixel in the purple. We know that that came from a 3x3 three three section of the green, and indeed, each of the greens came from a 3x3 three three section of the yellow. So for that purple, we know that there's this 5x5 five five section of the input called the receptive field, which corresponds to that specific activation pixel. And indeed, if we find that the data in that specific receptive field moves, we know that the activation is also going to be moving. So sweet, we can exploit this. All right, uh, so yes, exactly. Estimate the motion of activations by estimating the motion of receptive fields. All right, so we propose this algorithm called receptive field block motion estimation. We still have a few tricks up our sleeves. So the reason why it's important to think about this uh, in, a, in a crucial way is because the cost of this is very important. Because as you'll see, this is going to be a part of our front end that's going to be deciding if we're going to do a predicted frame or a keyframe. So since we're running this for every single frame, it's got to be cheap. So, if we think about what a receptive field looks like, it looks like this. It's quite large, it might have a little bit of overhang, that overhang is based on padding, uh, and, uh, and it covers a significant section of the input. And indeed, other receptive fields, so now we're going like activation by activation, so we're rolling through, and we're seeing that these receptive fields actually have a significant amount of overlap with themselves as well. And so what this overlap means is that if we were able to, if we uh, simply naively just did basic block motion estimation with receptive field by sweeping across the input, we would waste a lot of work. And instead we don't, and, and so we don't do that. We consider this concept of this block here. We're showing this, and this is a specific reuse tile. Uh, basically what that means is it is uh, elements which we will compose up into receptive fields. So let's see what this looks like when we're performing motion estimation. So, based on the network uh, architecture, we find where our receptive fields are, those define where our tiles are. Here I'm showing these specific, uh, this specific, uh, these tiles as an example. So if we look at any given receptive field, what we can do is we can actually construct that receptive field by the fact that we know that we have a specific set of these reuse tiles that it is composed of. So then, we can perform motion estimation for these tiles, memoize our results, and then use that to construct each individual different receptive field. And because we now know where it was in the keyframe and where it is in the predicted frame, we can get our motion vector. So that's how this works. All right, so how about motion compensation? This is a little bit more simple. Basically what we're doing is we're finding our motion vectors, in this case uh, an x uh, and y of 2.5, and we are going to take the index of the activation that we care about, that we're trying to produce, and we subtract that vector from that index, and then use the result of that to index into the stored activations. Now you notice that these numbers, 2.5 and 2.5, those are not integer values, uh, and this is a very common case. And the reason, uh, uh, or sorry, the, the way that we can handle this if we have a fractional vector uh, is to basically do interpolation. So if we're not indexing a specific activation in our reference, we interpolate to find that new value. And uh, finally, uh, which, k -frames are, which frames should be keyframes? 
So uh, there are many reasons why the system might fail. Uh, many different uh, reasons, I mean, this is indeed why uh, video compression is such a complicated subject. Uh, there may be de-occlusion, there may be new objects. Uh, in this case, I'm showing a very simple example. Basically, you see that the man's hand has moved, and so he's exposing up more of his leg. And the pixels in that section of his leg did not exist in the reference frame, which means they cannot be produced. So, how do we figure out when this amount of change is important enough to warrant a new keyframe? So for that, we uh, basically use RFBME, the algorithm that I showed before, and when we're doing that block motion estimation, we're computing that absolute pixel difference for different positions. This means we have a set, this means we have basically an error of our motion estimation. So we can compare this error against the threshold that we choose based on profiling data. So it's the classic uh, training, validation, and then finally testing data sets. Uh, so we use our validation to choose a threshold that has a specific degradation in accuracy. And that's how we define our system. Okay, so for hardware. To see how this works in a hardware system, we wanted to look at things that were very competitive. We didn't want to look at GPUs, we wanted to look at the top-of-the-line accelerators. So what we're, what we're looking at here is IRIS and EIE. IRIS is a systolic array-based convolutional uh, neural network accelerator that is especially good at convolutional layers. And EIE is a compression-based sparse accelerator for fully connected layers. Both of these are optimized for their specific use case. So, uh, of course, the CNN prefix is mostly convolutional layers, so that's done by an iris, and uh, the suffix has a combination of the two. So, because we started with our embedded vision accelerator, now we can accelerate that embedded vision accelerator with EVA squared. So, EVA squared performs the motion estimation and motion compensation that I described earlier, and here we'll see how we do the, the mapping of those elements. So this is a, a block diagram of EVA squared, uh, and while there may be many elements here, and they may have a little bit of fancy names and uh, lots of lines, uh, it's actually quite simple, and so I'll walk you through it. So uh, here's uh, an example. We're going to take our input frame, frame zero, and that's going to go into our first pixel buffer. Now, uh, our keyframe uh, choice uh, module, we'll notice that this is the first frame that's being analyzed, there is no reference, and so we're simply going to pass, or I'm sorry, we're going to choose this to be a keyframe, because we can't produce any predictions, uh, and then because it's a keyframe, we will simply send the, uh, the pixels with no changes to them directly to the rest of the system, so IRIS and EIE do their thing, and we take the output of IRIS, uh, that intermediate uh, computation that I was describing earlier, and we put that into our buffer, our specialized buffer. So now, the next frame comes in. Alright, so it goes into the other buffer, and uh, we, because we now have a reference to look at, we can perform that motion estimation that I was talking about. So we do the motion estimation, we get the vectors, and we also get the error value, which gets checked by the keyframe choice. And in this case, we find that our error is below the threshold, which means that we have successfully understood the motion in the scene, and therefore we can know that this is going to be a predicted frame. So rather than sending the pixels to the rest of the system, instead we perform that motion compensation that I was talking about earlier, and this produces our predicted activations, which gets finally gets sent to the rest of the system. At this point, it's important to point out that EVA squared leverages the sparse techniques that have been uh, put forth by many of the researchers in our community, and because of this, we're able to save 80 to 87 percent on both storage and computation. This means that rather than having to store the activations off chip, every single piece of data is on chip. All right, so the evaluation. We wanted to look at real data. We didn't want to create any contrived examples because, of course, all of the benefits that I'm going to show you of this system have to deal with the properties of the data. So if the data changes, if it's random images, this all doesn't make any sense. So for this reason, it was important to get good data, and so thankfully, YouTube Bounty Box was released. Uh, it's a data set that consists of uh, uh, basically YouTube videos. Uh, it's five times the size of uh, ImageNet, uh, and, it uses, and it has both object detection and classification separate data sets, and this is what we use for our evaluation. Uh, we used AlexNet and uh, we used faster RCNN with VGGM and VGG16. Uh, these are beneficial because they are direct comparisons to, uh, to IRIS and EIE, and also uh, our technique can be applied to other networks, so it makes sense to work with these so we can have a fair comparison. Uh, the hardware baseline, we use IRIS and EIE, as I've been mentioning before, uh, and for our uh, implementation for the evaluation of the new hardware that we put forward, uh, we wrote that in RTL and synthesized it in 65 nanometer TSMC. All numbers for IRS and EIE have been scaled appropriately to 65 nanometer. For our area, uh, we find that EVA squared is very, very small, which is excellent. Very low area overhead. This makes sense because we don't have any particularly large buffers. Yes, we do have the buffers for the pixels, but that's significantly less than the model size. 
We find that EIE is the vast majority of the area, but this also makes sense because their whole uh, sort of purpose for being a, a, an optimized accelerator is to have lots of storage for that model so they don't have to go off chip. Iris, because it doesn't have all those buffers, is much smaller, despite the fact that they have a significant amount of logic on chip. Uh, yes. So basically, we're a very, uh, very insignificantly small portion of the chip while still giving these benefits. So the specific benefits have to do with both energy and latency. The reason why we're able to get both of those rather than trading one for the other is because we're fundamentally reducing the amount of computation that's necessary to get the same result. So here I'm showing Iris, EIE, and EVA squared. And you'll notice something interesting. Iris is the entire bar. <laughs> and this is because uh, it is constantly going off ship to get those values, and so it's burning up a bunch of power and time. Uh, and this is for the, uh, the not the keyframe, because remember the keyframe includes the motion estimation, but this is the baseline, the CNN prefix and CNN suffix, and there was no changes from us. So the best case scenario is a predicted frame, because we're able to get all those savings. Um, and here you see that EVA squared comes into the picture. And you also see that we're very quite tiny, which is good. We have a very small amount of overhead for performing all the operations that I described to you before. So, excellent. But, of course, we can't always do predictive frames. We need to do keyframes sometimes so that we can update our reference. And so this average bar is showing you uh, a weighted average of the time where you go down the path of performing the CNN prefix or going down the path of performing motion compensation for that predictive frame. At, uh, at a high level, uh, EVA squared uh, is uh, very remarkably effective. So uh, it enables 54 to 87 percent savings, um, all while incurring less than 1 percent accuracy degradation. And indeed, we can change that amount of accuracy degradation. We just use 1 percent because it's a rule of thumb, but you can change that based on tuning uh, your keyframe choice metric, that amount of acceptable uh, error. We test this on both uh, classification and detection data sets, and indeed we find that there is much more of a sensitivity to motion, as you would expect, in detection, because it's important to make sure that you move the bounding boxes for that particular application. Very low keyframe uh, percentages, uh, and yes, so this is uh, a, a good system, we think. In conclusion, temporal redundancy is an entirely new dimension of optimization. We've been thinking a lot about uh, sparsity in the past, and that's awesome, we should keep that up. But we should also now begin thinking about temporal redundancy. And indeed, the talk uh, that will be happening uh, immediately after we'll be talking about this, there was also a talk earlier in the accelerator, uh, in the accelerator session uh, earlier on that is talking about this. So I'm really glad that this community is latching onto it. Uh, AMC and EVA squared uh, significantly improve efficiency, and they're also highly general, and I really want to really get this point down. So it applies to many different CNN applications. Yes, we tested a few, and that's excellent, but it can also be applied to segmentation, it can be applied to scene labeling, because we have these, ex uh, these uh, abstractions that we can leverage to be applied to different networks. Additionally, we can be applied to many different kinds of hardware architectures, because we're just a little small widget that we can access. And finally, motion estimation and compensation, while we provide some algorithms that can be used, if you have a particular algorithm that you prefer, just slide it in and it'll still work. So, yes, that's uh, what uh, we did, and thank you so much. Hi, uh, <clears throat> intriguing talk. Uh, my name's Rick Kaye from Qualcomm. I'm just curious, have you tried this Accelerator with like the mobile nets, some of the, the depth wise uh, convolutions rather than the spatial convolutions. We haven't tried that, although in my, in my follow on work, we're actually we're playing around with that now. Um, uh, basically, uh, the thing about that is that uh, we still have the concept of a receptive field despite the fact that the network has changed, and so we can still leverage that to perform the motion estimation. Uh, they're also significantly cheaper, of course. You know that's the reason why they're they're so nice. Uh, so that means that your, uh, your your cost for per frame for keyframe is going to be reduced. But uh, the uh, the, the uh, feature extractor is still a significant portion of the computation, far more than the the uh, suffix, and so we're still applicable to that. Um, Mustafa Mahmoud, University of Toronto. Um, I'd like to ask how uh, how um, how large is the on chip uh, storage for uh, for Eva? Yeah, so we have about a half a megabyte for each of our pixel buffers. Uh, that's the vast majority of the, uh, the, the uh, storage. So this is enough to store the um, um, intermediate activations? <laughs> oh, so that's for specifically for the pixel buffers. The activations are, are, are much smaller than that. I forget the exact number, uh, but I think like, it was like a quarter of our area. Uh, do you have an idea um, how this could be provisioned for high resolution applications? like? If you have a continuous vision application that uh, has a like multi megabits application, 
Yeah, um, so I, I've been working, work, mostly working with things like self-driving vehicles, which use, they, they take in high resolution, but then they immediately uh, shrink it down uh, before it goes into the network. Uh, and, but that's not to say that there aren't high resolution applications. Uh, indeed, there's a, a paper at FAST, uh, 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 Vivian C's work, uh, which works on high resolution in terms of actually increasing the resolution. Um, so I definitely see a lot of uh, potential there, uh, but obviously your point is well taken that it would increase the size of the pixel buffer significantly. Thanks a lot, Mark. Great talk. Uh, this is Rohit from Illinois. I have two questions for you. Uh, first is... to one, I think, because we, we have a few people behind you. Okay. So uh, when you do convolutions, instead of just convolutions, you have many more things like non-linearity or batch normalization. So how does your backtracking mechanism or algorithm deal with those things? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, we have an entire section of the paper dedicated to that. Um, yeah, this is very much an approximation. Uh, we're in the family of approximate computing. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, the good thing about that is that everything about machine learning is empirical. So when we're doing our testing, you know, for example, for our thresholding, we're relying on the fact that the data uh, properties will remain the same. So uh, in terms of whether or not it is exact, in other words, the motion compensation on the activations is exact, I would say no, it is not. It is definitely uh, approximate. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the talk. It's Lee from Huawei. So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm just thinking, because you're comparing two frames like next to each other, there's still a lot of the area within the frame that doesn't really need to be computed anyways. Have you considered to just to skip those computations? At least you can save some time on the suffix compute. Are you referring to the concept of partial computation? So yeah. Perhaps, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, to simplify the problem, we have not performed any partial computation, but that's very much something that we're interested in. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay.